Church, let's all stand if you would. Let's stand. Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, ladies and gentlemen. It's taken us... I think it's taken us three years to get here. (laughs) Romans chapter 9. Very, very, oh my goodness, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. So many commentators, so many of those uh, in, in church today and or in antiquity just glossed over these three chapters because they're so hard. They're so difficult. If you wanted to go to a... Um, a, a class of gifted kids who are super bright. You know, like the kind of school Elon Musk might have gone to? Or did he even go to school? Did he even need school? This is where a special bus would pull up and drop off these geniuses, and they would go to their little class on how things work. And chapters 9, 10, and 11 is the genius course of not only the book of Romans, but in, of much of the Bible. And so we're going to go through this methodically. Why? Because God put it in the Bible. We're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, which means God wants us to know it. So we need to put on, do you remember back in school, back in 1850s, 1860s? They would tell us, put on your thinking caps. Remember that? Put on your thinking caps. Because this is some deep stuff. And some of it's going to shake you. But you need to stay all the way through with this. I mean, I'm sorry for some of you who are visiting, but the final answer is not going to come for weeks. For weeks. Yeah, but, but, you can, but you can log on anywhere around the world and find out the answer. Okay, so you ready? Romans 9, I'll read the odd number verse if you'll join out loud in the even. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. Of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Verse 7. Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, not of the Lord God, but the Lord of promise, are counted as the seed. Wow. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. Verse 11, for the children not yet being, this is called the parenthetical insert, Paul drops in there. For the children not yet being born, nor having done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It is said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob, I have loved, but Esau, I have hated. Father, we pray that by the workings of your Holy Spirit, you would unlock our hearts and our minds to these deep truths. And Father, that our preconceived notions might be to see this in a certain way and come to a conclusion prematurely. So God, I pray that you'd give us the ability to discipline ourselves to learn that whatever we've done this week or going to do this week ahead, that right now, this next hour is the most important hour of our week. And for some, it could be their most important hour of their eternal life. So Father, we pray that you would again, as always, we call upon you to be our teacher. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Introduction to Romans chapter 9 as we look at a message series titled, The Choice. Is it yours? You ought to write that down if you're a note taker, and I hope all of you are note takers. 
What about choice? Does man have a choice? Is God involved? Is God sovereign? Is there some sort of sovereignty given to man? Is there really the ability to choose? Or did God make a bunch of robots? Did God make predetermined, listen, preloaded in advance, pre, what's the word? Teleonomic would be the science word where there has been uh, data uh, put into something in advance and that all that you and I are living out right now is just something that you have no control over, you have no input in, you have no decision making. In fact, is your life today one that is built, listen, it sounds silly, but I'm dead serious, today after service, will you go have breakfast or lunch somewhere and will you pick and choose what you want or will you operate under a pre-program of something that is already in you that you must do it a certain way that you will do it a certain way? These are things that are being sprinkled into your hearts and your minds right now, not to necessarily believe, but to analyze in light of the Bible. And um, I just want to read some things to you right now. I wrote these down. I just want them to be accurately said, so I don't want to miss anything. And so in chapter 9, this is key, what we have before us is the most hotly contended uh, chapter, in fact, the next three chapters totally in the Bible. And the reason being is that it challenges our human capabilities to understand or to fathom the very nature of who God is and what God thinks and what God does. God doesn't answer to us, church. God is sovereign. I know it comes to a shock, but God is not wringing his hands right now to figure out what the United Nations is going to do next to save the world. God knows all things. He cannot learn anything. And he's eternal. He's existed before time. And when time comes to an end, yes, time is a physical property. According to the Bible, the physics of time will someday come to an end. And that is called eternity. And if there's ever a reason for you and I to read and to study the Bible closely, my friends, in its entirety... These three chapters, starting with chapter 9, is that very discipline. But as I mentioned earlier, it's among, there is among many great scholars that compete and have competing views on the nature of God, on the sovereignty of God, and the divine attributes of God. But the section of Romans chapter 9, if you would look at it this way, is divided up into three things. Can you write this down in your notes? Romans 9 is divided into three subsections out of the three chapters. So just mark that down. You're going to see them. But chapter 9 has three subsections. But three chapters make up the argument in total. It's very technical. So for example, chapter 9, you'd want to write this down. It deals with God's past dealings with Israel. Chapter 9 talks about God dealing with Israel in its past. Chapter 10 is the second chapter in the argument, and it deals with God's present dealings with Israel. You'll find that very interesting when we get into chapter 10. And chapter 11 deals with God's work in the reestablishment of Israel and, ultimate, listen, ultimately the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Church family, if people were today to say that God's done with Israel, have you ever heard that before? If somebody says that and you believe them, then take your Bible and just flush it down the toilet. Go ahead and burn it. Because if you believe that, then you're cutting out 27% of your Bible that speaks about future events, which mostly deals with the nation of Israel and its future. There's a reason why Israel became a nation again on May 14th, 1948. A second time. No nation in the history of mankind has ever become a nation a second time. But yet the ancient prophets said that that's exactly what would happen. So when somebody says, I think God is done with Israel, you need to either have them read Romans 9, 10, and 11 or, or walk away from them because the Bible says, do not get into arguments with fools. It says, don't contend with fools. It, it, there's no, there's no, you don't, don't need to do that. 
So I'm going to be challenging you off and on over the course of these next few weeks uh, with, with this statement. The choice is it yours, and here it is. Yes, the choice is yours, but where did it come from? Where did we get the ability to choose? I want you to be asking yourself that question. Where did the opportunity come from, and why are you held responsible for your choices? Everybody listen up. Right now, I've got the attention of the Arminian view, the Calvinist view, uh, the Augustinian view, whatever it might be. Number one thing is, do you and I have choice in the matter? Can we choose God or refuse God? The answer to that is yes. But what does God know that you and I do not know? Answer, everything. But he certainly knows those who will choose him and those who will reject him. Does he not? Yes. But if, those, if there are a group of people who reject him, why? We want to be asking the questions technically why. Now, please, church, this is going to be a really dry few weeks, but you're going to get smart. <laughs> Seriously, why do I have the ability to choose? It's a built-in attribute given to me by God. You can't deny it. You're going to have for lunch, or you're going to pick whoever you're going to love based on your choosing. You're not a robot. One of the most foundational truths about God being a person, look, we, we think we're persons, hello, he's the original person. He has personality. He's a person. And that's why the Bible says you and I have been created in the, in the image of God. We are like him in small, so to speak. Of course, he's sinless. Uh, we're, we're the opposite of that. But we have been created in his image, and we can choose. But I think you might find it interesting and quite comforting, actually, to realize as we go through this, and again, you ought to write it down, because people have a lot of battles with their friends of certain denominations, which is very sad, right? Think about it. Um, denominations are made up by, by people. Do you know that? The Anabaptist, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Lutheran. Just fill it in. I don't care what flavor you are. And by the way, this is a, this is a non-denominational church. See, what, is, what, what does non-denominational mean? It means there's people here from every walk of life. There's even people here from the church of atheism, I'm sure. Did you, that was a little joke. Sorry. <laughs> church of atheism. Anyway, I know it's early. We'll be, do, we'll be handing coffee out momentarily. But... Um, but beware that, that you follow the teachings of a, of a committee or of a man or of a group. You want to follow the teachings of the scripture. And you can take great comfort in knowing that the Bible says, no scripture is given of any private interpretation, but has been given by God. Nobody can make stuff up and then slap a Bible verse on it and say, see, you can't do that. The Bible forbids that. So I'm going to be repeatedly asking you, where did you get your ability to choose? And I'm going, to, I'm going to be asking you, why in the Bible are you held responsible for your choices if you haven't been given the ability to choose? But then if I do choose God, isn't any of the merit upon me? Of course not. Of course not. Because who gave you the opportunity to hear the gospel? Who provided heaven? Who died on the cross for your sins? Who, who extended the invitation to you? God. See, God just gave you and I the ability to be creations of his that built into us is a level of sovereignty, meaning we choose. Thus, listen, this is, this is bright and early for this to be dropped on you. <laughs> when people get to heaven, they will stand or fall on their face in joyful awe and say, thank you, God. For getting me here. Thank you, Lord. You're amazing. And people who slide into hell wake up to the burning sensation of flames and they have nobody to condemn but themselves for having rejected the opportunity that God had given them. In other words, those that are in hell are responsible for, uh, to themselves for being there. God's not to blame. He didn't want them to go there. You're going to learn this a lot. But those that are in heaven cannot take any credit for being there because God provided the way. Did everybody get that? Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. I think you should do that. It's all God. It's all God. It's all him. 
And as we get into this, I want to remind you of this. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 30. This is groundwork, foundational. Romans 8, begin into verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. That is the qualifier. Do you love God? Secondly, to those who are called or the called according to his purposes. Three characteristics there. Verse 29, here it is. For whom he foreknew, that is, he could never learn anything. He knew in advance. He also predestined. Notice, predestination is based on foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, preeminent one, among many brethren. I pray that's all of us. Verse 30, moreover, whom he predestined, remember how he predestined? Based on what? Foreknowledge. These he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. That's a great foundation, always. And the great news is that Romans 9 doesn't make salvation complicated. It makes it more accessible, if you read it carefully and study it as we will. More available to all, not less. It doesn't narrow the path. It actually widens the path. Quite powerful to whoever would come to God through uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Another background verse. You guys okay? We haven't even started yet. (laughs) Romans 3, verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Yikes. Verse 21. If you're all about the Ten Commandments, that's awesome, but they can't save you. Verse 21 tells you that. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Believe, believe, mark it down, believe. That's, this is going to be key. It's going to be the key to uh, Isaac versus Ishmael. It's going to be the key between uh, Jacob and Esau. It's going to be the key. It's, it's not that they're ethnic Jews. It's all based on belief in Christ. Amen. Belief in God's word. Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. Oh, I want you to come out of this series of teachings so strong in what it is that you believe because the Bible teaches it, in my opinion, so clear. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that, is, that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Paul the Apostle said this to the believers in Rome and notice what he's talking about. The common denominator is not the fact that you're a Gentile or that you're a Jew. The common denominator is your faith in Yeshua, that's Jesus, as Hamashiach, as Messiah. That's the key. That is the foundational thing. And that's what takes Gentiles like us and Jews who trust in Jesus as Messiah and we together can declare that Abraham is our father. And I think God just showed us an awesome picture in the Bible where Abraham was a Gentile that God called out of a pagan worshiping system. And then by his faith in the Lord, then God called him a Jew, a Hebrew. Think of that. Tell tell your Jewish friends that. The first Jew was a Hebrew first. Or what, excuse me, was a Gentile first. The first Jew was a Gentile first. That brings us hope. Because there are those walking around today saying, nope, it's ethnicity. Nope, if you're born, if you've got this bloodline, you're in. It doesn't matter what you say, do, or whatever. You're in. The Bible doesn't teach that. Then there might be those that are outside that ethnic group and and feeling horribly lost, that there's no eternal hope. Listen, I had had a situation happen to me where I asked someone for a time, for the time of day. Literally, I asked them for the time of day. And the guy looked at me and turned around and walked away. I was in Jerusalem and I asked my friend, I said, what, what was that? He said, he's not allowed to talk to you. I go, why is that? He goes, you're a Gentile. And I go, what's wrong with asking the time? And he said, well, there's a certain group of people that believe that you were created for the flames of hell 
and uh, he won't acknowledge your existence. That's the group that they belong to. Well, I'm so glad the Bible doesn't talk about that. Very encouraged by that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, all introduction. Galatians 3, 26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. That's not water. It's, it's not water baptism. It's the baptism of the Spirit of God putting you into the body of Christ. Big difference. That's Romans 12, if you want to, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, if you want to read on that. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is so key. Someone say amen, please. Make sure you're right. That is key. Remember that. Romans 3 and Galatians 3. Vital. Church, write it down. Point number one is this. The choice is it yours. Number one is found in verses one through five, and it's this. The scope of God's sovereignty. What is it? The scope of the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. What scope of that sovereignty does God possess? The answer is all sovereignty. You say, why do you even tell us this, Jack? Because there are some denominations that teach that God doesn't know all things. They don't announce it in their sermons. They don't announce it publicly because it generates a lot of controversy. I, listen, I want you to know something. God is either sovereign or he's not sovereign. And there's not some sort of limitation of God's sovereignty. Amen. Who are we to say to him? Jeremiah put it this way. If a potter's working on the potter's wheel and he's shaping clay, does the clay ever jump up and say, why are you making me this way? <laughs> In fact, if it were to do that, you would just smash it and make it into an ashtray, like we all did in fourth grade. The clay's got no power. It's at the mercy of the potter. God's sovereignty is true, it is real. So the first thing that we see about this, everybody, is found in verses one and two, and it's this, that the scope of God's sovereignty includes sorrow and grief for the lost. Did you know that? So that's kind of sobering. Yes, it is, and it ought to be. Verse 1 says, I tell you the truth, Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. Now remember, this is the Jew of Jews, Paul, formerly Saul, saying, my conscience also bury me witness in the Holy Spirit. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm absolutely wracked with pain in my thoughts and in my emotions and those emotional thoughts and pains are in complete agreement with that of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit feels and thinks the same way. What is that, Paul? That I have a great sorrow and a continual grief in my heart. He's going to be talking about his brothers. By blood. His weeping, his sorrow, his grief over the lost. That is the Jews who refuse to accept Christ as Messiah. Notice with me that Paul, listen, that Paul announces that his conscience is weighing heavily upon him, and the Spirit of God is in agreement with him. Notice this, please, that Paul is not saying that God is unjust or unfair, is he? Notice that. You should write that down if you forget, because there will be people who will say, oh, Romans 9 teaches a capricious God. That's the term, capricious. Capricious. That's disgusting. That the God of the Bible would be labeled as capricious? That, he, that he, he's, he thinks one way on Monday and a different way on Tuesday? No, he's not. The Bible says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not whimsical. He never changes his mind. He's not like a reed blowing in the wind. No, he's, he's steadfast, the Bible tells us. And we need to remember this very, very thing that Paul is announcing to us that there's no injustice with God. That God is fair, that he's holy, that he's pure, that he's loved, that he's good. So he lays that down right from the beginning. Friends, if God pre-programmed people to hell, then what in the world is Paul concerned about? Are you hearing me? Think, 
think, think. If people are pre-programmed to hell and some pre-programmed to heaven and there is no you and I being responsible for choosing what's right or wrong, then what is he lamenting? If that were the case, he would say, hey, those of you guys who are going to heaven with me, awesome. Sorry, some of you. You're just all going to burn in hell. I'm not, a, I'm not even going to give you the time of day. Why would I talk to you? God doesn't do that. God doesn't say that. Well, you know, this God of the Bible just throws people down into hell. What kind of a God is that? Listen, don't say that anymore. You look like a nut. God never said that. You've made that up emotionally. He doesn't do that. But when those who, when the invitation goes out to actually receive, to invite, to know Christ, reject that, there's grief, is there? Isn't there? There's sorrow among us who know the Lord. We weep over the lost ones in our lives. I am... you know, this grief that Paul is talking about, he's going to soon ask God if it's po- you know, really, if it's possible. I'd rather have my name blotted out of the book if my brethren would be saved. And uh, if I stick to my notes, we'll get to it eventually where there's only one person in the entire scripture outside of Paul who ever said that, and it was Moses. Moses says, remove my, remove my name from the book of life if these stubborn people of mine will make, make their way into heaven. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. Paul says the same thing. Take out my name so that they can come in if it's possible. It doesn't work that way. I have not known, I've not seen that level of love and commitment that you would give your life. Look, it's one thing to give your life. Right? If somebody throws a hand grenade, a Marine is programmed to jump on it to save his other Marines. It's automatic. He doesn't, he doesn't, if somebody throws a hand grenade, he doesn't go, oh no, hang, hang grenade. <laughs> He's on it. Instantly. Gives his life to shield, to take the hit so others can live. Automatic. No greater love does a man have than he lays down his life for his own friends, the Bible says. Isn't that just a small representation of the great God and Savior who laid down his life, as it were, on the hand grenade of hell to take the hit for all of us? Jesus paid for that at the cross. He died there on the cross for my sins. All of my sins, past, present, and future. My entire life, Christ died for. I was lost. You and I were lost without him. And he died in our place. Some of you may be waking up to this reality right now. And the beauty of that is Christ has gone before you. And you're hearing the good news now. That he loves you. 2,000 years ago when he was crucified. Do you know this? He didn't, he didn't get killed. Jesus, it did, something didn't go bad. The Bible says all of this was done by the predetermined counsel and for knowledge of God, that Christ should suffer for all, the just for the unjust, that by faith in him, we might receive the righteousness unto eternal life. Wow, what a God, what a God. The scope of his sovereignty is awesome. Yes, of course, it includes sorrow and grief among the lost. Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14 tells us that therefore are... Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Notice in English and Hebrew, the capital S stands for deity. And shall call his name, God is among us, or Emmanuel. God dwells among us. Isn't that interesting? That's the famous Mary birthing of Jesus that we call Christ Mass, or to gather around the Christ. Isaiah 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. The word Everlasting Father means the one who governs all time. Prince of Peace. Verse 7, and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And upon the throne of who? David. David, and over his kingdom. Kingdom, the kingdom, Bible students, write that down, circle it. The kingdom is what 
land mass or land area that was promised to Abraham. In the millennium, Christ will sit on the throne of David and the kingdom shall be established. What kingdom? The kingdom of Israel under the reign of Christ. The Bible says in Ezekiel, and David will be his prince. And the region will go huge. Boy, you think the UN's having a hard time right now with the size of Israel? Boy, do they have a, I can't wait for Christ to return because the Bible gives us in the Old Testament the scope all the way to the Nile, up all the way to the Euphrates River, up the region, much of Iraq, all of Jordan, Lebanon, that will be the kingdom of Israel. It's huge. It's never been realized. Solomon came close. But it, it, by God's design, it was not fully realized because there's one king that will establish it. His name is Jesus. And it's absolutely glorious. The Bible says in, Je in uh, Genesis 15, verse 5, Then the Lord uh, brought Abram outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It's pretty amazing. Say, Pastor, I'm dying. I'm, I want to go to heaven. Trust Christ. Do I need to give my money away to the church? No, no, no. Do I need to do children's ministry? Nope. What kind of works do I need to do? Can you tell me? Can't, so I can get right with God? None. Zero. I know what it is. It's parking lot ministry, isn't it? <laughs> you be nice to those people. No, it's not even that. I think you guys know that the thief on the cross didn't, didn't do any of those things. All he said to Jesus was, will you just remember me? And Jesus took that little glimmer of faith. The Bible says a smoking flax, a, a, a wick that is smoldering, God will not extinguish. Is your faith little today? Are you hurting? Are you struggling with doubt? God says a little Wick that's still smoking, I will stoke its flames. Are you, are you like a broken reed? You know when a reed uh, is, is dented, it, it, lump, it lumps over, it's still alive. It doesn't look alive, but it's hanging low. Are you hanging low? He says, I will not snap it. I'll prop it back up. God's promises to you. And God tells Abraham, go look at the stars. You say, well, who does that pertain to? Well, if you keep reading the book of Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation, you know the answer instantly. It's all those who are truly the children of Abraham. You think it belongs, you think that's a Jewish verse? For Jews only? No, we read a moment ago that we are children of Abraham by faith, thus we are children of God. It's faith, it's not works. Should we, okay, should we do good work? Should we be good citizens? Should you have brought all your ballots to the ballot collection today? Of course. Somebody's going, I forgot. You still have like th till three o'clock to bring them on in, right? Think of that. Should we vote? Should we drive within the lines on the street? Of course. Should we brush our teeth? Yes. Be a good citizen. Pick up the trash. Your community where you live should be the best because of you. All right? We should do that. But faith, well, faith is an altogether different thing. Faith is not in those things I do. Faith is in that thing he did at the cross for me. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. What an amazing God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. Romans 3, 1. What then advantage of being a Jew is there? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Yes. 
there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. They're, they're his chosen people. Hey, everybody, listen up. Let's, let's make some news today. Why not? <laughs> Happens every week. Let's do, let's do this. Israel is still God's chosen people. That's what he has said in his Bible. Israel, when I say Israel, I'm talking about Israel, those who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If they are the believers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's an automatic default that they will believe that Jesus is Messiah. David did. Abraham did. Think of it. Ezekiel did. Micah did. Why not you today? And so he goes on to say, In verse 3, true, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. Is the scripture, uh, as the scripture says about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. That's God's Right, that is God's person, that is God's prerogative. Absolutely awesome. So listen, I'm going to repeat this again. The choice, is it yours? Remember, the answer is yes, the choice is yours. But where did it, where'd you get that ability to choose? I'm stressing that. Where did the opportunity come from? And why are you and I held responsible for our choices? Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 35. We continue on with this. Sorrow, grief over the lost, yes. Luke 19, verse 35. Then they brought him, it says, it's a little donkey, it's not some person. This is Palm Sunday, we're, we're coming up soon on Palm Sunday. Luke 19, then they brought a little donkey to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they sat Jesus on him, verse 36. This is a very sweet scene. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road, verse 37. Then as he, Jesus, was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, many, those of you who have been with us, you see it in your head. We we take every tour on this path. This path still exists today. It's still there. It's epic. You come right at the crest of the Mount of Olives, and beneath you is the Kidron Valley. Between the Kidron Valley and where you're standing is the Garden of Gethsemane. And you go down that path, and then you go up to the Eastern Gate, or the Golden Gate, as it's known in Jerusalem. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king. So (laughs) even though you and I weren't there, the eyewitness account was, those who were there, what was their response? They shouted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You guys, they started quoting Psalm 118. Josephus, the Roman historian, says it was over 100,000 people shouting. The Rose Bowl. Think Think of SoFi Stadium packed. And they're shouting this to Jesus. And some of the Pharisees... you. These guys never disappoint. (laughs) And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher. I have to put I have to say it that way because I don't I don't like them. (laughs) Like this. Teacher, they're no teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, I think Jesus missed an awesome opportunity right there. <laughs> what I, if I were Jesus, I would have said, all right, all right. Hey, everybody, shh. And it goes silent. And the Pharisees who hated him, they're like, <laughs> that's great. And then you would have heard this, praise the Lord. <laughs> what was that? The ground starts shaking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Big rocks and boulders. Praise the Lord. 
And then there's some, you know, rocks. There's some like stones. Praise the Lord. And then there's the, the, those are little rocks. Praise the Lord. It would have been amazing. What's the word? Cacophony of all of this, uh, this, this rock concert of praises to God. Oh, it would have been amazing. But, but that did not happen. I was just making that part up. Now, as they drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Why? What's the weeping? Everybody's cheering. Shouldn't Jesus be cheering? Why is he weeping? Well, he's going to tell us, saying, if you had known. I wonder how many people God would say in here today, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. Wow. But now they're hidden from your eyes. He makes that announcement to them. Why is it hidden from their eyes? Well, we're going to give you the answer. Matthew chapter 23 is the answer. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Listen, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not what? I'll keep reading in a moment, beginning at verse 38. Let me ask you this. Why is he crying? Why is he lamenting? Why is he saying, if you had only known? Why didn't you know? He's being a little harsh on them, isn't he? Not at all. Did you know Palm Sunday was revealed to the day? In the book of Nehemiah and in the book of Daniel to the day. Did you know that if you knew your Bible, you could have gotten up and got your kids all dressed up and you would have gone down to the Mount of Olives and you would have gotten palm branches because you would have recognized today's the day. According to the scriptures, the Messiah arrives to the city of Jerusalem today. He's going to be riding on the back of a donkey, Zechariah 9.9 said. And he's going to have a rumor about him, having been born of a virgin. Hmm, who could that be? Well, for 33 years, it's only been about that guy. And he had to be born in Bethlehem. Hmm, that's him. Oh, and he had to be guilty for performing miracles on the Sabbath. Miracles like opening the eyes of the blind. Who do you know who opens the eyes of the blind? Who was born in Bethlehem and had the controversy of being born of a virgin without an earthly father? Who the Pharisees called him a you-know-what, by the way. Read your old King James Bible. They called him that word. You're illegitimate, and that's not the word they used. All of a sudden, this one of a grand scandal is now weeping, holding them accountable to know the day. If there's no choice in the matter, why hold them accountable? This is none other than a charade. This is a joke. Are you hearing me? This is for real. You're not going to go into heaven because your dad is going to heaven. You're not going to heaven because your mom's going to heaven. I spoke at a certain school for their own good. I won't mention their names. I was called as they wanted me to speak. I went to a school and I spoke at this school of a certain denominational persuasion. And I told the high schoolers, it was a student assembly, and I said, you need to be born again. Nicodemus was a righteous man, but he needed to be born again. And the president of that school walked up and took the mic right out of my hand and walked me off into the parking lot and told me, never come back. And I said, for what reason? And he said, because you see these kids, their parents are going to heaven, and that means they're going to heaven, automatic. And I said, you don't need to invite me back here. I will never put my foot on this soil again. You're not going to heaven because your, your mom played the organ in church or that you, you're, you're, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Well, I come from a long line of ministers. That may not be good. (laughs) Verse 38. Behold, see, your house, that's the temple, has left you desolate. That's not good news. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Did you know what? The Bible says in the Old Testament that when Messiah returns in the second coming, guess what Israel says? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In fact, 
In the, in the Old Testament, it says this. They're going to say it on day one. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going to say it the second day. And he says, on the third day, I will come to them. God is sovereign. But that doesn't mean you're off the hook. God is sovereign. And he's given you and I the ability to love, to express, to hate, to write, to sit, to create, to dream, to sleep. Think of it. And he expects you to do something with that. Remember, church, he wept, but he foreknew in eternity those that would believe in him. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined, remember that now, based on foreknowledge, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Amen. That's good news. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. I've been going slow now. I've got to go fast. Run out of time. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. God, this is God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purposes and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. But he has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Second argument, church, verses three and four is this. The scope of God's sovereignty involves love, compassion, and mercy. Verse three says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, According to the flesh, my DNA, who are Israelites. That word accursed, write it down. It means to be cut off or condemned. I don't know any love like this. The only love I can think about that's like this is when a parent. Have you ever, has your child, listen, our daughter, when she was eight months old, Ashley, our youngest, when she was eight months old, she was rushed to a children's hospital in Orange County, and they told us she's got somewhere around 50% chance to live. We don't know what's wrong, but she's dying. And we're going to do everything we can. She was put in quarantine. They quartered her. She, they, had to, they, they quartered her on all, on all four extremities because if you touched her skin, she began bleeding out through her skin. And so scab, scabs were building up on the inside. She was suffocating to death. It was unbelievable. She has a very, very bizarre, strange uh, disorder. And um, let me tell you something. When you hear that, you know, I think of, um, there, there are people here who are serving you on stage in worship. They're playing their hearts out. You don't know. You don't know them. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know, what, you don't know that their son has spent more time in the hospital in his eight years of life than he has outside the hospital, do you? But they're, they're here leading you in worship. And we say, why do you bring this up? Because I don't know any love like this. I'm, I, listen, I love you, but what I say, God, cast me into hell that they all might be saved. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, listen, I'm, listen, I love you, but not, not that much. <laughs> the only thing I can think of that comes close is when a child is suffering and the parent will say, oh God, give me their cancer. You hear me? If you've never gone through it, you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, God, give me their cancer. When your husband or your wife is now declared sick and dying, God, give it to me instead. I don't know any other love but that, that I've seen in a parent or in a husband or a wife. Awesome. The sovereignty of God and the scope of it involves compassion and love and mercy. And Paul lives that out. He said, if I could just take their place. My dear friend, announcement to all of us, nobody can take that spot. 
but God alone. And if you don't have him, you don't have it. Exodus 32, verse 31, then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, listen to this, if you, were for, if you will forgive their sin, but if you don't, if not, I pray, Moses is speaking, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, it doesn't work that way. Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit uh, for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sins. Did you hear that, everybody? If there's no choice in the matter of election, predestination, foreknowledge, then why is God holding Israel responsible for her choosing? I should say, why is God holding the individual Jew responsible for their choosing? Because nearly the entire nation perished in the wilderness, but not all, did they? Only from the old guard, two guys made it over with all their kids. Their kids believed. Remember the two guys that made it over from generation one? Joshua and Caleb. They led them into the promised land. All of their parents had to die, it says, because of unbelief. They chose not to obey him. So my argument is, if there's no choice, then how can God punish them? If you've got this worked out to where God punishes people who have no ability to choose, you've got a bad God, and I don't want anything to do with them. Oh, there's so much, but we'll end with this here. Verses four and five. The scope of God's sovereignty incorporates the full counsel of God. To whom, he's speaking of the Israelites, the Jews, pertain the adoption. The doctrine of adoption, spiritual adoption, is by God given to the Jews first. The glory. Who saw the glory? Who did God choose to reveal himself to first? The nation of Israel. The glory. The covenant. Who was given the covenant? Covenants, I should say. That's Mosaic, Abrahamic, and Davidic. David. The giving of the law. That didn't come to America. (laughs) It's not Canadian. Israel. The service of God. The promises, all the promises given in the Bible are given to Israel first. Did you know that, everybody? So does that mean we, don't we get any? We get them all. The Bible says you get them all through Christ. (laughs) He goes on to say, and of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. Are you sitting down, everybody? (laughs) This is awesome. Christ came. Who? Who's the who here? This is third grade English. Um, If Christ came, if according to the flesh Christ came, who is over all? It's Christ who is over all. He's the who. (laughs) And who is the who? The eternally blessed God Amen, amin, Hebrew, is it is true. That's what amen means, it is true. So church family, listen, we're almost done. Isaiah 28, 16 says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placed in a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Don't think, don't think of rocks. <laughs> Whoever believes need never be shaken. What was one of Jesus' identifiers as the stone, chief cornerstone that the builders rejected? You have to have choice to reject. Isaiah 43, 10. God says, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen 
that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Listen to this. Before me there is no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Let's all stand for this conclusion. It's worthy of us standing. God says, you heard him a moment ago, there's no other Savior but me. Right? Did you guys all get that? That was Isaiah speaking. I mean, Isaiah recording what God was saying. I want to read this. You watch. Uh, Next verse. It's a collection of verses. Here we go. Speaking of Christ, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. That's the word mankind, human. And being found in appearance as a man, a human man. Okay, right now, verses 7 and 8, something weird is up. Someone has come... And they decided to come to us in the form of a human. That should get your attention. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders. Which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment and who has established all the ends of the earth? In other words, who's the creator? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? What's his name? Lord, we pray in Jesus' name today that Father God, every man, woman, boy, or girl listening right now, here in this place and beyond, would understand from the Bible as they've seen today without man's opinions, pure word of God, that Jesus is both Christ and Lord, that he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, and that you save all those who put their trust in him, whether they be Jew or Gentile. Thank you, God, for blowing open wide the doors to salvation, to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. My dear friend, today, you need to tell God that you're going to respond to this truth. You're going to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have the time for you to come forward right now. But right, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, please. Nobody looking around. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. If you deny me, then I will deny you also. He didn't say how many people had to see your hand go up. But if today this made sense, maybe for some of you, it's the fact that you've heard the Bible clearly for the first time in your life. That's God speaking to you, friends. No one look at, Christians be praying hard. But today you're saying, I got it. I got it. I want Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins, to put his Holy Spirit in my life I quit today. I surrender. I yield now to my creator. I am now going to walk with him. I give my life to him. Sins and all. I'm coming to him and I'm jumping in the palms of his hands. If that's you today, will you raise your hand high? I'll just see your hand. God bless you. Raise it high. Don't don't raise it half high. All the way or, or not at all. God bless you and you and you. And you 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 and you. You, 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 wait, you, uh, you, hands up high, hands up high, you, way in the back, a bunch of yous. You, my friend. You, (laughs) yous all over the place. Father, I thank you for these decisions, and it's beautiful because it's just between you and them. Hallelujah. To God be the glory, church. In his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you.